This is the story of Eric and Ingrid and their first child. But on this wonderful summer day, the child exists as yet only in their wishful dreams. Her period is a week overdue. Jag tror jag väntar barn. Menar du det? Är du alldeles säker? Då kan jag i alla fall lämna in ett prov. Jag gör det. Ingrid calls the maternity center, where she gets advice to leave a urine specimen to find out if she's really pregnant. In the laboratory, a drop of specially treated blood corpuscles is added, and if the test is positive, the drop remains unaltered. If it's negative, the blood corpuscles form a grainy precipitate. The test takes about an hour. Ingrid had her urine test analyzed in the laboratory of one of our main maternity clinics. Ingrid is told that her test is positive. The doctor asks when she had her last menstruation. She says the 20th of June. The doctor then tells her that she can expect the child at the end of March. For practical reasons, the pregnancy is counted from the day the last menstruation began. From that date, three months in the calendar are subtracted and one week is added. This gives the date of birth with about a week's accuracy. The end of March. Seven and a half months more and she will be a mother. But Ingrid's own child is still only a tiny creature of about a fifth of an inch growing down in her womb. And it doesn't exactly look like a human being yet, although it has a heart that beats. Let's go back a little and see how it all started. A woman can have children between the ages of about 12 to 15 and 45 to 50. Every month, an egg is released that can be fertilized and develop in the uterus for eight and a half months. Down in the abdominal cavity in the pelvis lie the woman's inner sexual organs, the two ovaries where the eggs ripen, the oviducts where the egg waits to be fertilized, and the uterus where it will be embedded in mucous membrane. Through a narrow canal, the cavity of the uterus is connected with the vagina, the child is born through the vagina, which is also a warm and moist receptacle for the man's millions of sperms. But a woman doesn't generally carry more than one child at a time. Seldom more than one egg ripens at one time, and in each case the whole system must prepare itself for a long pregnancy. But if the egg does not become fertilized, the preparation must start all over again. This happens in repeated four-week periods. Such a period is called a menstrual cycle. It's controlled by hormones, substances sent out into the bloodstream, stimulating different organs to work. The whole process is started from the pituitary gland, which is situated in the middle of the head below the brain, with which it is connected by a stalk of nerve fibers. At the beginning of every menstrual cycle, pituitary is ordered by its superior centers to start sending out a hormone which stimulates the ovaries. The menstrual cycle is, for practical reasons, counted from the first day of the menstruation. This means that the first week is taken up mainly by the menstrual bleeding. In the ovaries, a group of egg cells begin to ripen. Around every one of them, a kind of vesicle is formed with thick walls and full of fluid a so-called follicle, with a ripened egg stuck to its wall. The follicles emit follicle hormone. However, all follicles but one shrink after a while and disappear. The mucous membrane of the uterus heals after the menstrual bleeding. The 
The pituitary now changes its hormone production and sends out a new hormone to the ovary to make it release the egg. This usually happens around the 14th day of the menstrual cycle. The follicle absorbs more fluid and grows big and thin-walled. Finally it bursts and throws the egg into the oviduct. Then it shrinks and changes into a corpus luteum, which is Latin for yellow body. This yellow body sends out both follicle and corpus luteum hormone or progesterone. The progesterone prepares the mucous membrane of the uterus to receive the fertilized egg. The pituitary soon withdraws its stimulating effect. The yellow body eventually stops functioning around the 25th day of the cycle. But this means that the mucous membrane of the uterus can no longer function or remain. And during the days after the 28th day, it is shed in the menstrual bleeding that marks the beginning of the next menstrual cycle. In the man's case, we have no such four-week periods. When, at the beginning of puberty, the pituitary starts stimulating his testicles to produce male sexual hormone, a continuous production of sperm goes on during his lifetime. The male counterpart to the female ovaries is the testicles, situated in the scrotum. The sperm is formed in long, winding ducts. From the testicle on each side, the sperm cells are led to a long, coiled tube called the epididymis where they ripen for a week or two. From the epididymis, they pass through the seminal ducts to the urethra, where the prostate also opens, together with the seminal vesicles. With sexual stimulation, the penis becomes erect and can be inserted into the vagina, and the sperms are pressed up through the seminal ducts by powerful muscle contractions. Before the ejaculation, the prostate is emptied first, then the seminal ducts, and lastly, the seminal vesicles. At the orgasm, the semen, containing about two or three hundred million sperms, is pressed out by pumping muscle movements and deposited in the vagina close to the opening of the cervix. From there, they have to go up through the cervical canal and its protecting mucus plug. This is ordinarily thick and viscous. But around the 14th day of the menstrual cycle, when the ripe egg is deposited in the oviduct, it softens so that the sperms can get through. Here they make contact with the mucus. The mucus molecules lie in long chains closely attached to one another, and this makes the sperm swim in parallel paths. On the way up the uterus and oviducts, fewer and fewer sperms remain. Maybe only about a hundred, that is one in a million, ever reach the egg. In every sperm is a choice of the man's hereditary characters lined on 23 threads, the so-called chromosomes. In the same way, there's a choice of the woman's hereditary characters in the egg. It is the yellow coils we see here. Only one sperm gets in. There it is. The head of the sperm swells up and turns into a ball of chromosomes. The sperm also carries two grains with it that go to each pole of the egg. Between the grains, the chromosomes are drawn towards the poles. And now we get two cells with both the mother's and the father's hereditary characters in each. As the selection is different for each egg and for each sperm, all children from the same parents are different, but they all look like mother and father, of course. The fertilized egg divides into smaller and smaller cells. At the end of the week, it takes for the egg to get down to the uterus. The cluster of cells absorbs fluid and turns into a vesicle with a small inner cell mass and an outer cell cover. The outer cover, here marked with green, will become placenta and fetal membranes, and the inner cell mass here marked with yellow, the child. Around the 21st day of the menstrual cycle, the vesicle will be implanted in the mucous membrane of the uterus. There's only about one week left to the next menstruation, but this must not come. 
The primitive placenta sends out a hormone to the yellow body, making it go on working, and the menstruation does not take place. It is this hormone that comes out with the urine and is analyzed in the laboratory test. When the menstruation fails the first time, the embryo, which is to become the child, is a flat thing with one sac on its back and one on its belly. It grows, and the flat thing seems to arch its back. It gets a head and a tail and a heart, and becomes a little human body, despite its having a yolk sac just like a fish spawn. Through the placenta it is nourished from the mother's blood. After a while, indications of arms and legs start developing on the little curved body, and when the menstruation misses out for the second time, these tiny buds have developed into hands and feet, with fingers and toes. The embryo has also got an umbilical cord. Through this cord, nourishment and oxygen flow from the placenta, and carbonic acid and waste products are delivered back to the mother's blood. Fourteen days after the second menstruation should have started, the eight-week-old embryo already looks like a neat little doll, one and a quarter inches long. Yeah. What a sour face in the morning. Morning sickness, of course, which is not unusual, especially during the first part of the pregnancy. Pregnancy implies a great change. No wonder a lot of things feel different. Many women feel unusually fit and happy during pregnancy, but just as many get depressed and find it hard to enjoy the fact that they're expecting a baby. It's nothing to be ashamed of. The joy and the sense of motherhood will come in due time. At those moments when the pregnancy feels depressing and heavy, as it sometimes may do even for the happy mother-to-be, she needs affection and encouragement from those around her, not least from her husband. Eric brings her tea in the morning, which is not only pleasant, but helps a great deal too. <laughs> 